Storm Boy Part 2 But sometimes Storm Boy saw things that made him sad. In spite of the warnings and notices, people hurt the birds. In the open season, shooters came chasing wounded ducks up the Kurong. Some sneaked into the sanctuary during the night, shot the birds at daybreak and crept out again quickly and secretly. Visitors went trampling about, kicking the nests and breaking the eggs. And some men with rifles who called themselves sportsmen when unable to find anything else to shoot at, bet one another that they could hit an egret or a moorhen or a heron standing innocently by the shore. And so they used the birds for target practice. And when they hit one, they laughed and said, good shot, and then walked off, leaving it lying dead with the wind ruffling its feathers. Sometimes, if it wasn't too far away, they walked up to it, turned it over with their feet, and then just left it lying there on its back. When Stormboy ran back to tell his father about it, Hideaway muttered angrily and Fingerbone slapped his loaded blunderbuss and said, by Jiminy, I'll fill him with salt next time if them fellows come back, boom, I put salt on their tails. When Stormboy laughed at that, Fingerbone flashed his white teeth and winked at Hideaway. Neither of them liked seeing Stormboy looking sad. When Stormboy went walking along the beach or over the sand hills or in the sanctuary, the birds were not afraid. They knew he was a friend. The pelicans sat in a row, like a lot of important old men with their heavy paunches sagging and rattled their beaks dryly in greeting. The moorhens fussed and chattered the ibises cut the air into strips as they jerked their curved beaks up and down and the blue crane stood in silent dignity like a tall thin statue as Stormboy went past. But one morning Stormboy found everything in uproar and confusion. Three or four young men had gone into the sanctuary. They had found some pelican nests wide rough nests of sticks, grass and pelican feathers as big as turkey quills and they had killed two of the big birds nesting there. After that they had scattered everything wildly with their boots, kicking and shouting and picking up the white eggs and throwing them about until they were all broken. Then they had gone off laughing. Stormboy crept forward in fear and anger. From behind a tussock he looked round sadly at the ruin and destruction. Then, just as he was about to run back to tell Fingerbone to fill his blunderbuss with salt, he heard a faint rustling and crying. And there, under the sticks and grass of the broken nests, were three tiny pelicans, still alive. Stormboy picked them up carefully and hurried back to hide away with them. Two of the baby pelicans were fairly strong but the third was desperately sick. He was bruised and hurt and helpless. He was so weak that he couldn't even hold up his head to be fed, so he just let it drop back flat on the ground as, so as soon as Stormboy or Hard Hideaway let go of it. I don't think he'll live, said Hideaway. He's too small and sick. Even Fingerbone shook his head. Dem bad fellows kill big pelican. Don't think little fellows stay alive now. He mustn't die, Stormboy said desperately. He mustn't, he mustn't. He wrapped up the tiny bruised body in one of Hideaway's scarves and put it by the fire. All day long he watched it lying there, sometimes moving feebly or opening its beak to give a noiseless little cry. Every now and then he poured out a drop of cod liver oil from the bottle that Hideaway had once brought for him and tried to trickle it down the baby bird's throat. Night came on, and still Stormboy watched the sick little fellow hour after hour, until Hideaway spoke firmly about bed and sleep. But Stormboy couldn't sleep. Again and again through the night he slipped out of bed and tiptoed across the dirt floor to the fireplace to make sure the baby pelican was warm enough. And in the morning it was still living. It was three days before the baby pelican was well enough to sit up and ask for food. 
By then, his two brothers had their beaks open hungrily all the time, although, of course, they were still too young to have their creels or fishing baskets ready. Anyone would think that I was a grandfather pelican, said Hideaway, by the way they always turned to me for food. You'll have to be, Storm told him, because their own father and mother are dead. Well, they needn't think I can spend all my time catching fish for them. Look at that fellow sitting up as if he owns the place. Oh, that's Mr Proud, said Stormboy. How do you do, Mr Proud? Hideaway bowed and scratched the top of the pelican's head. And what's your brother's name? Uh, that's Mr Ponder, Stormboy said. He's very wise and serious. And what about the tiny fellow, asked Hideaway. Is he Mr Peep? No, he's Mr Percival. Stormboy picked up the bird gently in the scarf and held him on his lap. He's been very sick. Welcome, said Hideaway. And now Grandfather Pelican had better go and catch some fish, or there won't be tea for the three Mr Peas. And off he went down to his boat. And that was how Mr Proud, Mr Ponder and Mr Percival came to live with Stormboy. Before long, the three pelicans were big and strong. Their white necks curved up cleanly, their creels grew, and their upper beaks shone like pink pearl shell. Every morning, they spread their great white wings with the bold black edges and flew three or four times round the humpty and the beach nearby to make sure that everything was in order for the new day. By then, they thought it was time for breakfast. So they landed heavily beside the humpy, took a few dignified steps forward and lined up at the back door. If Hideaway and Stormboy were still in bed, the three birds stood politely for a while, waiting for some sign of movement or greeting. But if nothing happened, Mr Proud and Mr Ponder began to get impatient after five or ten minutes and started rattling their beaks in disapproval. A snippery, snappery, snickery, snackery sort of sound like dry reeds crackling until someone woke up. All right, all right, Stormboy would say sleepily. I hear you, Mr Proud. He would sit up and look at the three gentlemen standing there on parade. I know what you're thinking, Mr Ponder. Time for respectable people to be up. Time for respectable pelicans to get their own breakfast, Hideaway grumbled instead of begging from their friends. And as time went on, he really meant what he said. At last, Hideaway spoke sternly to Stormboy. Mr Proud, Mr Ponder and Mr Percival will have to go back to the sanctuary where they came from. We just can't afford to feed them any more. Stormboy was sad, but he always knew when his father had his mind made up. Yes, Dad, he said. Well, put them in the big fish basket, said Hideaway, and take them in the boat. Yes, Dad, said Stormboy, hanging his head. So they caught Mr Proud first, and then Mr Ponder. Mr Ponder held their wings against their sides, and they were put firmly into the fish basket. Neither Mr Proud nor Mr Ponder thought much of the idea. They snackered noisily at Hideaway and raked their ruffled feathers crossly and glared out through the wickerwork with their yellow eyes. <laughs> Hideaway laughed. We've offended the two gentlemen. Never mind, it's all for their own good. And he bowed first to Mr Proud and then to Mr Ponder. But when it came to Mr Percival's turn, Stormboy couldn't bear to see him shut up too. Ever since the miracle of Mr Percival's rescue, he had been Stormboy's favourite. He was always quieter, more gentle and more trusting than his two brothers. Stormboy picked him up, smoothed his wings and held him close. Poor Mr Percival, he said gently. He looked up at his father. I'll hold Mr Percival, can I, Dad? Oh, all right, Hideaway said, taking up the two baskets. Come on, it's time we started. Hideaway sailed for five miles up the sanctuary before he stopped the boat. Here we are, he said at last. Then he opened the two bas baskets and took out Mr Proud and Mr Ponder. Off you go, he said. Now you have to look after yourselves. Then he pushed them off. They flew away in a high, wide arc and made for the shore. Now Mr Percival, he said. Stormboy pressed his head against Mr Percival and gave his friend a last soft squeeze. 
Goodbye, Mr. Percival, he said. He had to pause for a second to clear his throat. Be, be, be a good pelican, Mr. Percival, and look after yourself. He lifted him over the side of the boat and put him down on the water as if he were a big rubber duck. Mr. Percival looked surprised and pained for a minute and floated up and down on the ripples. Then he lifted his big wings, pedalled strongly and rose slowly up over the water. Storm Boy brushed at his eye with his knuckles and looked away. He didn't want to let his father see his face.